By the beginning of the 18th century, the religious wars were largely over and nation-states dominated Europe. The large chunk of land labeled Germany, however, is misleading. After the Thirty Years' War, Germany was broken up into more than 300 small states and would not recover economically until the 19th century. Spain continued its political and economic decline. Italy remained fragmented and economically weak, although many artists still sought out opportunities to study in Rome which was still seen as Europe's cultural center. England was in political and economic ascendancy. Eventually, industrial innovation would give Britain Europe's most powerful economy. In this lecture, however, I will focus on France. And French politics at this point in history were complicated. Louis XIV had destroyed Protestantism, secured France's boundaries, and created a unified nation state but his wars came close to bankrupting France. More importantly, his strategy of essentially keeping French aristocrats in an elegant holding cell, the Palace of Versailles, fell apart under his successor, Louis XV. The aristocracy reestablished their dominance, moved back to Paris, and if anything, tightened their economic control over peasants. I think you know how the story of this selfish and self-indulgent aristocracy ends, but meanwhile, they were sure having fun. Nothing captures the frivolous last days of the French aristocracy better than the art of the Rococo period. The leading Rococo painter was Vato, who has completely disappeared from the college board list. But I could imagine you're being asked to identify the art historical period of a Vato painting, so I'll show you one more. Vato deeply admired Rubens and imitated him but a comparison of these two paintings, which had a similar theme, also highlights the transition from Baroque to Rococo. So what differences do you see? Baroque art is heavier. It's more dramatic, more solid somehow. One of the art historians I listened to described Rococo as Baroque with the wind taken out of its sails. The figures are smaller. The colors are more pastel. The subject matter is usually deliberately lighter and the love is less serious and often illicit. So this may seem an odd introduction to our required Rococo work, The Swing, but I think this movie opening offers a brilliant vision of the decadent French nobility in the Rococo era. The movie is based on a famous novel, Dangerous Liaison, which was published in 1782, just seven years before the French Revolution broke out. The two main characters shown here in their movie versions are rivals and ex-lovers, who use seduction as a cruel game and a weapon to humiliate and degrade others. This clip is the movie's opening. It depicts the elaborate dressing ritual and artificial costuming of French aristocrats. So this painting takes Rococo to a whole new level of poof, a poof of pink, as our Khan Academy experts put it. The fellow hiding in the bushes is up to no good, and his lady friend seems rather pleased by that. One odd detail, the swing is possibly being pushed by a bishop. We know from an original source that that's what the pater, patron requested. There's some dispute over whether Fragonard was really painting a bishop here or just an unattractive layman. Still, the painting may offer a not so subtle hint about the church's alliance with this decadent aristocracy. Stay tuned for Voltaire. The alternative title of the work is Happy Accidents of the Swing. So what was the happy accident? Is it the lost shoe? Or the chance for her lover to look up her skirt? The lost shoe may, by the way, symbolize a loss of virginity. The girl in the swing is wearing a fashionable berger hat, that is a shepherdist hat. And this adds an element of irony as well, since shepherds are normally associated with virtue. They live close to nature, uncorrupted by the temptations of the city. It may also be a shout out to the popular philosophy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whom you'll encounter in tomorrow's reading. Rousseau believed that civilization corrupted nature and that human beings were happiest and most virtuous when they lived closer to nature. Marie Antoinette famously played at being a shepherdess at her own little country house. The operative word here is played. And indeed, Rococo reminds me of mannerism in its emphasis on artifice, on aristocracy, and on masks. Pop Culture for 40, where does this image come from? Okay, I haven't seen this movie. 
Uh, but I gather that the Disney movie Frozen, a character named Anna swings in front of a Fragonard wannabe. Note the Disney omitted the dubious lover looking up her skirts. They're just spoil sports. So we'll return to this work in our last unit, but I thought it made sense to introduce it here. First, since the Nigerian British artist has created a deliberate homage to the Fragonard painting. So, what's missing from this work? Well, she's missing her head, a not very subtle reference to what's going to happen to a lot of those frivolous aristocrats in the French Revolution. And what else is missing and why? Well, we don't see the dubious older man pushing the swing or the lover hiding in the bushes. So who's looking up her skirt? We are. Like much installation art, we the viewers are actively participating in the scene and, if you will, in the act of voyeurism. I mentioned earlier in this lecture that art will display more cross-cultural influence. So what strange cross-cultural tale does this cloth tell? The Dutch wax textiles in her outfit are an Indonesian batik design that was produced by Asian textile workers under the direction of British industrialists for West African consumers. Whew. African artists would further develop these textile designs and they later came to symbolize African culture and even the African drive for independence. I've included another example on the upper right. It is advertised as Dutch wax African kente cloth. It's made in Worcester, Massachusetts. Meanwhile, though staying on the theme of high fashion, here is one other famous Rococo artist who slipped off the list. Francois Boucher's patron was Louis XV's extremely influential mistress, Madame de Pompadour. Here again, you see the lush but cultivated landscape, a garden, not a scene from nature, a little lapdog, and all that pink. And here's a really over-the-top Boucher example from your reading. I could easily imagine the College Board asking you to identify the art historical period of this work. It is Rococo to the core. So here's one of those summary slides. I've only slightly modified it. Rococo art is lighthearted and frivolous. The content is less likely to be religious, more likely to be amorous. The major patrons were aristocrats, not the church. The colors are light and pastel, and we see little if any chiaroscuro. It is hardly surprising that a generation of artists, especially those who were unsympathetic with the aristocracy, decided to take a different path. But before we travel down that path and explore the art of the Enlightenment, I want to discuss one more required work that bridges the gap between Rococo and Enlightenment art. Elizabeth Louise Vigée Le Brun was a very successful painter in an era when women had a hard time breaking into the art world. Vigée Le Brun made her money painting aristocrats. She also hung out with aristocrats and supported their right to rule. Her political views forced her from France when revolution broke out, although she continued to make a living from aristocratic portraits, especially the Russian nobility. Her most famous subject and a personal friend was the notorious French queen Marie Antoinette. Vigée Le Brun painted more than 30 portraits of Marie Antoinette. Here's one of the most famous. So in what ways does this portrait show a Rococo style and in what ways does it introduce Rousseauian themes? Well, we see the pastel colors, the pink roses, the over-the-top costumes, but also a setting in somewhat less thoroughly tamed nature. Here you see an 18th century effort at political spin. Vigée Le Brun was trying to make Marie Antoinette a more sympathetic figure to the increasingly critical French public. Note the date. This was just two years before revolution broke out. Spoiler alert, her strategy did not work. Here's an earlier self-portrait, which could jump right out of a Fragonard painting, except that the artist is looking straight at us, self-confident in her art and her status as one of Europe's leading artists and one of very few women admitted to the French Academy. By the way, her membership in the Academy was rescinded after the French Revolution because the revolutionaries, following other theories of Rousseau, believed that men and women belonged in different spheres Men should run the world, and women should stay home with their children. And here's a later self-portrait, this time with her own daughter. Note that it's much more natural in style and composition. 
This artist has dropped off the list, although she appeared on past AP exams. Adelaide Labille Guillard is the other woman who was admitted to the French Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture. Note that like so many women painters we've seen, she painted herself painting, and also in this case teaching. Interestingly, this artist supported the revolution. On the right, you see her portrait of Robespierre. He was the leading figure in the reign of terror that sent so many of her former patrons to the guillotine. But this artist also got kicked out of the Royal Academy. Her sound politics notwithstanding, she was still female. Vigée Le Brun actually painted this self-portrait after she went into exile in Rome. So what do you think? Does this seem like a Rococo work? What kind of personality does it convey? Or does her naturalism and her determination to make her own way as an individual signal that she's more a figure of the Enlightenment? I think the answer is probably both, but it's to the Enlightenment that we will turn next.